threats to network security are continually changing as vulnerabilities in both established and newly introduced systems are discovered and solutions to counter those threats are needed. Studying this unit should give you an insight into the more enduring principles of network security rather than detailed accounts of current solutions. Ideally, after studying this unit, you should be able to apply the material appropriately in unfamiliar circumstances. In particular, you should be able to describe some threats to the security of communication networks and some of the countermeasures employed. On a less dramatic note, reasons why organizations need to devise effective network security strategies include the following. Security breaches can be very expensive in terms of business disruption and the financial losses that may result. Increasing volumes of sensitive information are transferred across the Internet or intranets connected to it. Networks that make use of Internet links are becoming more popular because they are cheaper than dedicated lease lines. This, however, involves different users sharing Internet links to transport their data. Directors of business organizations are increasingly required to provide effective information security. Countermeasures to the perceived threats must balance the degree of security to be achieved with their acceptability to system users and the value of the data systems to be protected. Before we move on to consider specific issues of network security, I need to introduce some important terms that I shall use when describing how data is stored, processed, or transmitted to other locations. These are confidentiality in terms of selecting who or what is allowed access to data and systems. This is achieved through encryption and access control systems. Even knowledge of the existence of data rather than the information that it contains may be of significant value to an eavesdropper. The integrity of data where modification is allowed only by authorized persons or organizations. The modifications could include any changes, such as adding to, selectively deleting from, or even changing the status of a set of data. The freshness of data contained in messages. An attacker could capture part or all of a message and reuse it at a later date, passing it off as a new message. Some method of incorporating a freshness indicator, that is, a timestamp in two messages minimizes the risk of this happening. The authentication of the source of information, often in terms of the identity of a person, as well as the physical address of an access point to the network, such as a workstation. The availability of network services, including security procedures to authorize people when they are needed. In general, attacks on data networks can be classified as either passive or active. A passive attack is characterized by the interception of messages without modification. There is no change to the network data or systems. The message itself may be read or its occurrence may simply be logged. Identifying the communicating parties and noting the duration and frequency of messages can be of significant value in itself. From this knowledge, certain deductions or inferences may be drawn regarding the likely subject matter, the urgency, or the implications of messages being sent. This type of activity is termed traffic analysis. Because there may be no evidence that an attack has taken place, prevention is a priority. Traffic analysis, however, may be a legitimate management activity because of the need to collect data showing usage of services, for instance. Some interception of traffic may also be considered necessary by governments and law enforcement agencies interested in the surveillance of criminal, terrorist, and other activities. These agencies may have privileged physical access to sites and computer systems.
An active attack is one in which an unauthorized change of the system is attempted. This could include, for example, the modification of transmitted or stored data or the creation of new data streams. The figure shows four subcategories here. Masquerade attacks, as the name suggests, relate to an entity, usually a computer or a person, taking on a false identity in order to acquire or modify information and in effect achieve an unwarranted privilege status. Message replay involves the reuse of captured data at a later time than originally intended in order to repeat some action of benefit to the attacker. For example, the capture and replay of an instruction to transfer funds from a bank account into one under the control of an attacker. Message modification could involve modifying a packet header address for the purpose of directing it to an unintended destination or modifying their user data. Denial of service attacks prevent the normal use or management of communication services and may take the form of either a targeted attack on a particular service or a broad incapacitating attack. For example, a network may be flooded with messages that cause a degradation of service or possibly a complete collapse if a server shuts down under abnormal loading. Because complete prevention of active attacks is unrealistic, a strategy of detection followed by recovery is more appropriate. Venturing beyond the organization's premises, there are many opportunities for interception as data passes through external links. Satellite, microwave, and wireless transmissions can provide opportunities for passive attack without much danger of an intruder being detected because the environment at the point of intrusion is virtually unaffected by the eavesdropping activity. Satellite transmissions to Earth generally have a wide geographic spread with considerable overspill of the intended reception area. Although microwave links use a fairly focused beam of radiated energy with appropriate technical know-how and some specialist equipment, it is relatively straightforward physically to access the radiated signals. In general, detecting and monitoring unencrypted wireless transmissions is easy. You may have noticed that, when you switch a mobile telephone handset on, an initialization process starts, during which, your handset is authenticated and your location registered. The initial sequence of messages may be picked up by other circuits, such as a nearby fixed telephone handset or a public address system, and is often heard as an audible signal. This indicates how easy it is to couple a wireless signal into another circuit. Sensing a communication signal may be relatively straightforward, but separating out a particular message exchange from a multiplex of many signals will be more difficult, especially when, as in mobile technology, frequency hopping techniques are employed to spread the spectrum of messages and so avoid some common transmission problems. However, to a determined attacker with the requisite knowledge, access to equipment, and software tools, this is all possible. This is encryption, a process that transforms information, that is, the plain text, into a seemingly unintelligible form, that is the cipher text, using a mathematical algorithm, and some secret information, that is the encryption key. The process of decryption undoes this transformation using a mathematical algorithm in conjunction with some secret value, that is the decryption key that reverses the effects of the encryption algorithm. An encryption algorithm and all its possible keys, plain texts, and cipher texts is known as a crypto system or cryptographic system. The figure illustrates the process. Cryptography is the general name given to the art and science of keeping messages secret. It is not the purpose here to examine in detail any of the mathematical algorithms that are used in the cryptographic process, but instead to provide a general overview of the process and its uses. There are two main requirements for cryptography. 
it should be computationally infeasible to derive the plain text from the ciphertext without knowledge of the decryption key. It should be computationally infeasible to derive the ciphertext from the plain text without knowledge of the encryption key. Both these conditions should be satisfied even when the encryption and decryption algorithms themselves are known.